All right, hello everyone. Um, the market is, is not doing that great. So I wanted to just kind of hop on and do a really quick webinar with everyone because it's people have just been really stressed about it. And I, and I get it because they should be. It's, this is not a normal event. So I wanted to kind of give you guys an overview of what happened, what's going on, what investors should do, and then we should move from there. So as always, I have my disclaimer, you know, this webinar is only for educational purposes. It's not constituting a offer to sell or solicitation of an offer to buy or recommendation of any security or product or service by the IV Investor LLC or any other third party, regardless of whether it says security, product or service is referenced in this class. Furthermore, nothing in this class is intended to provide uh, tax, legal, or investment advice, and nothing in this class should be construed as a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold any investment or security or engage in any investment strategy or transaction. The IV investor does not represent that the securities, products, services discussed in this class are suitable for any particular investor. You are solely responsible for determining whether any investment, investment strategy, security, or related transaction is appropriate for you based on your personal investment objectives, financial circumstances, and risk tolerance. You should consult your business advisor, attorney, or tax and accounting advisor um, regarding your specific business, legal, or tax situation. So let's get started. Oops. All right. So who am I? So my name is Courtney Richardson. I am the founder of the IV Investor. I am a, so you probably are like, okay, well, that's fine, but who? who what like gives you the right or the authority or the information to be able to talk about stock market issues um, in any like detail? Well, I'm a former financial and investment advisor for one of the top brokerage fir firms in the world. The stock market crashed on September 29, 2008, and I was working actively as a advisor at that time. But um, as we'll talk about later, I saw it coming. We all kind of saw it coming. We didn't know what, exactly what day was going to happen, but the market was, was kind of on its last legs when the market actually finally did crash. I've been teaching um, students how to invest in the stock market for about six years. I'm an investing in cannabis expert. I was named one of seven Black millennial financial experts to follow in 2019 on Instagram by Black Enterprise. I was named as one at one of nine of the best financial planners of color for 2020 by Black Wallet. So that's kind of my background. I'm an attorney also by trade. Um, I have a JD and an LLM in taxation. I've been in this money game for as long as I can possibly remember. So I like sharing that information with you so we can all be just better investors. So tonight, what are we going to talk about? The question is like Black Thursday, what happened today? And then the next question a lot of people have been asking is kind of like, all right, so does that mean we're in a bear market? And then the next question is that, you know, what does all of this mean for investors? Okay. So what happened today? Well, today was Black Thursday. Um, Black Thursday was March 12, 2020. And it was called Black Thursday because the stock market lost the most in a single day since 1987, which was the 1980s, October 19th, 1987, there was a stock market crash on that day and stocks dropped about 23%. And after that point, um, what ended up happening with those stocks is, is that, well, let me clarify with the market, is that there was a decision that was made that they said never again will they allow kind of stocks to, to act in the free fall. So they in, instituted a electronic system called circuit breakers. So the circuit breaker is that if, they, if the market drops, there's three levels. So if the market drops 7%, then, um, and that's all, and when I say the market, we're talking about the S&P 500 index, which is the index of the top 500 stocks uh, that are trading in the United States. So that's kind of your background. So think about Microsoft, Apple, like think about all those companies, you know, Macy's, uh, we'll say, you know, I don't know, Morgan Stanley, Boeing, all these companies are in a basket in the S&P 500. Um, it's the top 500 companies and it's basically weighted by their size. But one of the biggest things is that it's most indicative of the market as a whole. We all look at the Dow um, and the Dow Jones when they say the market, the Dow Jones uh, 30, which is 30 stocks that are most indicative of the US economy. But when we're really looking at the market itself, we're looking at the S&P. So when you hear them saying the S&P, you're thinking Standard & Poor's 500, top 500 companies that are trading in the United States. When you hear the market and they're talking about the Dow, it's the 30 companies that are indicative of the US economy. 
and they kind of use them interchangeably. And sometimes that can get a little confusing. But if you kind of listen to context clues, you're like, oh, they're talking about the Dow or oh, they're talking about the S&P. Okay, so I, I shared this about the circuit breakers because um, after 1987, they said never again. So they instituted, like I said, these circuit breakers. Level one is seven, a 7% 7 drop from the day before of the S&P's close. So the day before of the S&P's close, so that's 7%. And then the next is 13. And then, so 7% so will stop the market for 15 minutes. Basically to kind of just say, everybody go to your corners, chill out. Okay, all right, breathe, it's okay. Let's not, you know, be so hasty. So the next level is, is that if the market drops 13% from yesterday's close, then that's a level two. Again, it stops for 15 minutes. Now, if it stopped now in level three, if it, if it drops 20% from the previous day close, everybody goes home. The market is stopped. And it ha all of this has to happen before 3.30 because it happens, unfortunately, at but at 3.30, they're not going to stop the market because, of course, it's the end of the trading day. So just to revisit the trading day, um, the market is open from 9.30 Eastern Standard Time to 4 o'clock. So you can see why, you know, if something happens at 3.30, they're just like, you know what, we're just going to take this L. And so today, also, the Federal Reserve Bank injected a one and a half trillion dollars to try to like stabilize the market and basically combat the, corona, the coronavirus or COVID-19 fallout. And like I said, so I already talked about what we mean by the stock market. So we have three major indices, indices that we're following. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, uh, we follow the S&P 500, and we follow the NASDAQ Composite. So the NASDAQ Composite, I believe, is like 100 stocks that are kind of on the NASDAQ. And it may actually be the whole thing. I can't remember on the NASDAQ because nobody really talks about it that much, except when we're in these situations where they're saying, oh, was there a pullback or something like that? So before I go forward, is there any questions before I go ahead? Because I just want to make sure that, I mean, we're going to be covering a lot of ground tonight and I don't want to miss anything. Um, if you have a question, um, I don't, sometimes it's not easy to write it down and come up with it at the end because you're like, oh, I forgot the context of what I had that question in. So please feel free to, um, to ask any questions that you have. So, um, So here's the big question that everybody's been asking, and they kind of know why um, this has been going the way it's been going, but I think we need to put it in perspective. So the whole problem, the whole problem, the whole issue started, um, it's, it actually started end of February. So about February 24th is when we started seeing the market results of the COVID-19 uh, virus. We started really starting to see like, okay, something's really wrong, and we're starting to see a real slowdown. So that's the first thing. So with um, then, so the, when we're starting to see the slowdown, people are starting to get concerned because they're like, hey, you know, China is really a big portion of the supply chain. Basically, you know, a lot of things are made in China. You know, this iPhone that I have here, a lot of the parts are made in China. We'll talk about some of these Chinese exposed companies um, a little bit later in the conversation. So yeah, there's a lot of companies out there that have China exposure and people started to get very nervous. Um, so time, you know, as more cases were discovered, more cases were um, tested, and um, we, you know, more more were tested, and then, you know, this is where we we're kind of getting, and people are like, oh, something's really wrong, and then Italy decided to shut down completely, which was not a bad thing to try to contain, contain the virus, but then there was more that kept popping up. The United States started getting a significant amount of, of um, of uh, new cases so it just started getting really heavy so then this weekend saudi arabia and us and russia got into it so saudi arabia is a member of opec and just opec offhand i can't i can never remember what it stands for but it's the organization of petroleum exporting um i think communities something so whatever but that's what OPEC stands for so it's about 13 companies Saudi Arabia pretty much is like the big dog of the OPEC companies and they have like OPEC friends like it's OPEC and friends so they'll call OPEC like allies OPEC plus and Russia is part of OPEC plus so because of this global slowdown that they've seen in factories and, and the lack of travel because of what's going on across the globe um, oil demand has gone down. So when you, when your demand goes down, what goes down with it? The price. 
So they're saying, hey, our prices for our oil is going down significantly. What we need to do is decrease the supply to increase the demand to kind of push our, our numbers kind of back to where we would like them to be per barrel. And so when Saudi Arabia said, hey, we're going to cut our production, we want everybody who kind of produces oil to, to cut production, Russia was like, no, we're not doing that. And Saudi Arabia was like, for real, you're not going to do this? And Russia's like, no, no, we don't want to do that. So Saudi Arabia said, hold my beer. What we're about to do is this. So they actually offered a dis. They started moving their oil at a discount. So because they're like the biggest producer, they're like really kind of messing up the the whole economy in the market um, in terms of oil. So that kind of popped off over the weekend. So let's put it all perspective now. You have the coronavirus or COVID nineteen going on. It's kind of really starting to disrupt the world. Then you have this oil thing going on. So now they're beefing, and now we ha and that actually caused the oil prices to drop even more because. Of of this whole discount. So now we have oil prices, you know, we have COVID-19, we have oil prices going down, and this is over the weekend. So whenever there's some mess over the weekend or overnight, please expect the market to be down. And as we were starting to see the market slide a lot in the last two weeks, I was like, mm, I think, and this is on Monday, Monday I was like, uh, I really think that there's going to be a problem. So needless to say, there was a problem. Remember how I talked about the circuit breakers? Down 7%, down 7%, the circuit breaker came on as soon as um, the market opened. And the, and the way that happens is that people will put orders in after the market closes and they execute first thing in the morning. But if everybody's trying to sell, it's going to push down the price. Remember, we were talking about supply and demand. So they're going to push, 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 push down the price. And before you know it, we hit 7% down. So the market, the circuit breaker exercise, and it was the first time it's exercised, I believe in like almost, I want to say like 20 years. So it's been like some time that this has ever happened. So it's, that's kind of, it's not uncharted territory. And a lot of people have been saying that like history, as if you've been in my classes before, I say history doesn't repeat itself, it rhymes. So it's been rhyming and we, it's just not been going very well. Um, but it's some stuff that we've seen before, just in a different way. And then finally, we have some recession fears. Um, now, and it's, it's kind of hard with a recession because a recession, you can only tell that you, you were in a recession by looking back going, oh, okay, the last two quarters, we had declines of gross domestic product. That's what a recession is. But you don't know that until you're in the third quarter looking back on the other two. So that was kind of another thing, kind of fueling the whole fire is that we have all this stuff going on. A lot of uncertainty. People do not like uncertainty. Boom, there goes your market. Okay, that happened on Monday. But remember what happened last night, the NBA shut down. President Trump said, you know, we're not going to be taking, you're not taking anybody coming in from Europe. So a lot of that increases the fear. And again, people are like, oh, I'm out, I'm out, I'm selling. And that's what happened today. So the circuit breaker came on again. So this is the first time like consecutive circuit breakers happened in the trading week. So yeah, now we're starting to get into like, not necessarily, I wouldn't, it's still uncharted, but I don't think when people say uncharted, I think people get very panicky. And I don't think, like, I don't want you to panic. Like, even if the bottom completely falls out, do not panic because it, it makes it worse emotionally. So um, so here's the thing that I want to talk about next is that we've, we've kind of hit on these other things that are going on. And then we have some companies with China exposure. Whew, they did not have a good day today. So what I share with you is that semiconductors are basically electronic chips. Um, they, as you can see, they didn't have a good day. The biggest uh, drop of these companies was microchip. They're down 15% from yesterday. That's a lot. Um, Qualcomm, I actually talk about Qualcomm and Corvo um, in my five, investing in 5G class. So again, like these are things that you should probably pay attention to and try to figure out exactly what, what's next for these companies. Um, you know, this is kind of like a blip, a, blip, a blip or a glitch or something that will over time re like resolve itself. Or are these companies not strong enough to withstand some kind of like uh, tumult tumultuous like um, economy issues and experience? Like, so there's that question. But here's a random one that has 67% has of China of revenues coming in from China. Wynn Company. So I gave you guys a picture of when I went to Atlanta, I went to Vegas um, in September. So that's not my picture, but it's a great picture. Um, when is actually like a big casino and gaming resort. So they actually get a lot of money from China. And as you can see, they were down 
And I think they were down 15%, not to be, just because of their China exposure, but also because a lot of people have not been traveling. Um, so they're certainly not be traveling to places where there's a wind resort. So just kind of keep that in mind. So these are the things that you're going to start seeing. And people are like, you know, is this a time to buy it? I'm like, uh, I don't know, because we don't know what's going to happen. Like, is when, you know, financially sound enough to kind of withstand the storm? Or are they over leveraged with a whole bunch of debt? Like a lot of companies are out there. Um, so it's it's really a lot of things going on. So um, I definitely like to share these things. Now, in the semiconductor space, same thing, but they're in a space that's growing. They're in a 5G space, so that may be a little bit different for them. But again, you have to do your research to figure out exactly, like, of the companies that are down, is this a down because everything is down and everybody's like, oh, my gosh, or is this – like basically are the prices coming back to life you know that song back to life back to reality i'm not gonna sing but it's kind of that whole thing like did they come down and they're supposed to be down like they are or you know or are they um or is it kind of artificial drop you just don't know yet you have to know a little bit more about the industry to know those things so i tell people this is why i tell people invest in what you know just don't go willy-nilly buying whatever because you think you should be buying i want you to be smart and strategic investors so the question, um, the next question I want to address is, you know, are we, are we in a bear market? Yes, we are. We are definitely in a bear market. So a bear market is when prices fall 20% or more from its 52 week high or the market's 52 week high. So in terms of bear territory, we hit their bear territory and the Dow Jones, uh, the Dow Jones industrial average yesterday. Today, we hit it in the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ composite. They're down 20% from where their 52-week high was. Um, also, so we're in a bear market. So market sentiment is like widespread pessimism, fear, all of those things. Um, but interesting enough, like I said, the, the market, the 52-week high was like less than a month ago. So this is kind of like, really? So I, I tell people to put these things in perspective. Like, you know, I, I really look at the market. I should have given you guys a picture of Jenga. I look at the market like Jenga. When it was that high, I was like, this is, people were like, oh my gosh, the market's so high. And I was just like, I've been here before. No, no, I'm, I'm good. You know, and I started like being strategic about what I was looking at, what I was kind of considering to be um, some moves. And I was really upset with Robinhood because I actually put in, I believe I put a call in or a forgot what I did but it didn't execute because it basically ran right through like Mark Robinhood went down maybe last week before last and I couldn't like execute my trades and I was really upset because it's a tr account that I don't use regularly but it was like my play account I was like oh this is great and I was like up three hundred dollars I was like come on Robinhood so that was really frustrating so before this, we hit this bear territory. We're definitely in a correction. A correction is 10% down. And maybe the last time I had a conversation, we were about 15% down from the most recent high. So almost the bear market. So the question is, um, let me just kind of look at what the bear market looked like kind of over time. So if you know anything, and I kind of talked about it before, September 29th, 2008 was the day the stock market crashed. I believe it was down about 8.9%. And I don't have my pen. And if you know my classes, if I, whenever I pull out that crazy pen, it like never goes away. So I'm not going to touch it. But if you see to the left, this September 22nd um, is over here. And then you kind of see this, this uh, drop here. But then there's a little bit of a recovery and then it kind of comes down here. That is the day of the bottom of the market. The mon market actually bottomed out um, in March of 2009, excuse me. So the market bottomed out six months later. So a lot of people are like, should I buy now? And I'm like, ah, hold on, hold on. There might be, you know, this may, this is kind of like, I want to say the beginning of the end. So it's like the beginning of like the super slide down, but we may not be there yet. So I just tell people just to hold on, you know, kind of start looking at your watch list, really start sacking your cash, um, continue to dollar cost average in your retirement. There's things that you can do, but I just tell people like, you know, history tells us that this is just kind of like the beginning of the slide. It's a, it's a real de de um, decrease and a real slide, but this is not like kind of like, oh, it's going to pop right at, up after that. So I want to put those things in perspective. Um, now, here we go over here. Now, this little tail and this drop over here is the tail and the drop from the most recent. That's what kind of put us in, quote, the bear market. But as you can see, we're still higher than we were in 2008, and we're still actually higher than we were in 2019. 
So I, I kind of want to put that in perspective also, because I know it looks scary, but if you look, we're still kind of on an upward trend. We're still upward and we're still higher than we were a year ago, but it's still very scary. So I wanted to put that um, in perspective. So the question that a lot of people have been asking me, like, what does this mean for investors? So with retirement, I really want you to check your allocation. And you're probably going, what's an allocation? Like, well, how do you have your money spread out in your retirement? A lot of people got really excited when the market was doing really well and they kind of dumped everything in stocks. Hold on, partner. That's probably not what you should be having because your retirement should be set up between bonds and stocks. So if you're in your 30s, I tell people subtract 100 from your age, like your decade, and it will give you your stock allocation. So I'm in my 30s. So my stock allocation and my retirement accounts are usually about, it's a little bit more aggressive than this, but it should be around 75. It should be about, I should really say it should be about 70%. But um, I, you could be as far as 80% and still be fine. But being 100% in stocks is, is not really where somebody in their 30s should be. So, you know, it gives you an idea, kind of like a rough estimate of where you should be. But especially as you're getting ready for retirement, if you're older, if you're in your 40s or, the, or your 50s, you should not have that much, much exposure to the stock market. You should have fun, some for growth. But if you're in your 50s, let's do that calculation again. 100 minus 50 is what? So you should have about 50% in stock. So if something like this happens, you don't lose your entire account. You lose some, but you don't lose your entire account. Um, and like I said, you may want to consider um, increasing your contributions. I mean, this is this is like money. You know, the stocks are, and that's just say mutual funds are are lower in terms of cost per share. And people felt like they they can time the market in retirement. And they're like, I'm just going to stop until later. And I'm like, ah, no, just continue to do what you're doing. You may want to increase your contributions if you can to take advantage of buying more shares when they're cheaper. And you know, just do it that way. Um, and then also be defensive. Like I have my retirement allocation, like what I, how I have my retirement account set up. And then I have like my play accounts, my play accounts. I've increasing my cash. I've been making a watch list. I've been changing my watch list because there's more things that I find interesting, but I'm also looking to get a little defensive. And what I mean by getting defensive is that when there is a, let me back up, you know what? I completely forgot to discuss this. So when you have a bear market, you um, kind of start the beginning of what we consider a recession. So that being said, is that we're kind of heading into a recession. So just keep that in mind. But the things that tend, the, comp, the industries that tend to do well in a recession are def, what we call defensive sectors. So that's going to be your consumer staples. Think about, when I say consumer staples, think about like Colgate, Palmolive, think about Pepsi, think about Philip Morris, think about there's, a S, um, there's an ETF called XLP, and it's a consumer staples ETF. So those things are going to do relatively well. Healthcare does relatively well um, in a recession or a, a decline. And then utilities. Um, I'm kind of on the fence about utilities has kind of been the standard, but I'm on the fence. I think telecom is the new utility, but I'm not really sure about that. So I'll, I'll revisit my idea later on in life and um, I'll tell you guys if I was right or not. And then also, I think it's really important for you guys to learn advanced strategies, like learn options. I've ran a couple of option strategies. I have a, I have a put on Ford um, right now that's in the money. Um, I ran another option strategy on Clorox that I made a lot of money on. Um, I'm trying to think there was another one that actually didn't go through. I think it was on um, Advanced Micro. It was on AMD, but it was the day that, my, um, that Robin Hood made a mess. So either way, but that's another way for you to kind of bet on the stock market when you understand what's going on, but you don't have to put up a whole lot of money. So options just kind of as a, a overview is that it's basically a hundred shares of a stock, but it's not, it's based on a hundred shares, but it's never going to be the full amount. So for example, if I, I have a, a put option on Ford and I think I paid like $30 or something. Um, I don't, I didn't pay much at all. Um, so sharing that, you know, if I would have bought a hundred shares of Ford, I probably have spent $900 or $700 or whatever it is to that. No, actually it's like five something. Um, so $500. So I spent $30 for an, an option um, to actually buy Ford at a lower price. So it's just, it, I'm not gonna get into the options aspect, but it's another way for you to, to actually play on the stock market without spending a whole bunch of money, like buying a full stock, a full, full hundred shares of stock. Um, also learning how to trade. 
trading is a great thing to do. Now you can trade the market when like everybody, there's money to be made everywhere. It's just how you know how, it's how you actually learn how to do it. A lot of people don't want to, trading takes time. You have to like learn what you're doing. A lot of people don't want to put out that time, but it really does pay off. So those are the things that you can do as an investor. Any questions so far? I don't see any. Okay. Oh, I see someone's raised their hand. Hold on. Figure out. All right. Give me a second. I'm just like trying to get it together. Okay, so retirement. So the question is for retirement. Um, so is so the question is um, for retirement. Is it better to keep contributing at pre-tax at the stage or switch to Roth? So here's the thing: uh, where you put your retirement money in terms of taxes actually really depends on not the market but what's going on with you personally tax wise. So there's a lot of people who make a decent amount of money and they need to reduce their taxable income. I'm always gonna suggest their first place is that they put more money in the pre-tax bucket because it reduces their taxable income. So that's one thing. Um, but it also depends on how much time do you have to retirement. So a lot of the things that would make you decide if you want to do a Roth or pre-tax contributions depend on your income and depends on your time to retirement. The longer time that you have to retirement, um, the better it is if you have some after-tax money, which is your Roth account. Um, just keep that in mind. So it just really depends. I would definitely sit down, since it's tax season, sit down with your accountant and have that conversation with them about what would be best for your financial portfolio. Um, so again, it's, um, so I think it, a really good question is, is that, hey, if you have 25 or more years, you may want to consider a Roth, but it also more so depends on how much money you make to say, okay, well, I want to put, you can always put some money in a Roth, but it, it really may affect your tax burden because the way the tax, the TC Jay, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act really kind of messed a lot of people up. So they ended up owing. So contributing to your 401k helps offset what you may owe because it's pre-tax money. So I want you to put all of that in the mix. So I really want you to sit down and talk to a tax professional. So April asked me a question. So when I saw the market nearing all-time highs, um, did I change my allocation? Did I put more in bonds? No. So what I did do is I put some stop losses on. Um, now, I was also in the middle of moving my accounts over. So of course I wasn't like, I wasn't like, oh, the market's kind of being funky. Maybe I shouldn't move accounts over at this point. because so I was moving from Merrill Lynch to, to E-Trade. So a lot of my stop losses did not carry over. So I was really annoyed by that, but it's, it's life and it happens. So I really just put stop losses on the, the positions that I was long in. That's what I did. Um, you know, there wasn't too much because bonds and the problem with bonds is that bonds are so low right now because interest rates are so low. It's kind of like, eh, I'm not really doing much of that. So I'm just better off putting a stop loss on and keeping it moving. And then if I can add more money to it, then do it that way. Um, there are some short term instruments that you can use, but again, they're just not yielding that well. I hope that answers your question, April. So um, any other questions? And you're welcome. Okay, so, so here's the thing. So here's the, the opportunities that a lot of people have been asking about. Like, so opportunities that I wanted to talk about, like I said, is being defensive. You have some defensive stocks that I want you to look at. Look at defensive sectors. You have consumer staples. Think about makeup. Women, um, it's not to be sexist, but a, um, women or whoever uses makeup, whoever that may be, they're not going to usually cut back on their makeup. They'll usually cut back on something else, but they won't cut back on like their kind of everyday routine. So keep that in mind. Um, like I said, you have Colgate, you have Pepsi, anything that you're going to need on a regular basis. Like, no, you're not going to be buying steak, but you still need to buy a box of cereal. You know, you may not be buying like the top brand of milk, but you still got to buy milk. So just kind of keep those things in mind. I'm um, also um, really just starting to learn some different tools and tools and tips and things to use. Like I said, meeting with traders, learning about options. Those are things that are really important, especially in this time. But a lot of people feel like they should have, like I tell people you have to get ready, like stay ready so you don't have to get ready. And so in these cases, a lot of people are like, oh, I really wish I learned options. So you're gonna have to take your time and learn them, but just don't rush yourself into trying to learn something and then you end up losing money. 
So those are my things. So I hope you guys over the last 30 minutes that we had like a really good conversation. I hope that you think that it's been time well spent so far that you learned a lot. Um, and like I said, I cannot, as you guys probably know, I can't cover everything that you need uh, to know about the stock market. Um, and I can, and I also can't really provide strategies in, in the Rocky Mart in the this Rocky Martin market in about the last thirty minutes. It just it's not going to happen. Um, so, but that being said, is that I have a special offer for you guys to know what you can, what you need to do, and what you need to know to get started. So basically, I have two classes together that are a bundle. So it's you'll learn how to invest in the stock market how to make a trade, what are dividends, and what are taxes relating to selling stock. Uh, but then also I had the class understanding bear market strategy. So how to protect what you own, like I said, putting in those stop losses, um, how to capitalize on index movements. We talk about in, inverse ETFs. So if the market's going to go down and you're like, hey, I want to like get take advantage of the market, but I don't want to do an option because I don't feel comfortable yet. You can do um, an inverse ETF. So I talk about those. And then finally, I talk about puts. So you can take advantage of stocks going down with puts. So what you'll receive is that you have the one hour class with an unlimited replay with periodic updates. Um, it usually runs, it runs for about $97, but it's a really good deal at $97, I think. But, on, but more importantly, because of the times and everything that's going on, I basically have it scheduled for $67 today because I feel like, you know, it's, it's been hard. It's been really rough. Um, and, and I feel like, you want to, I want people to learn, but you know, I want you to be able to learn and it's not going to be cost prohibitive to do so. So you guys can um, take the class in Teachable. And um, so I will definitely share that to, with you. And you guys get a code and it's called Bear Market 20 for uh, the Stocks 101 uh, class, which includes the bear market strategies. And I always want to hear your commentary. So if I need to add anything, you know, I always will add something in and shoot an email saying, hey, added this module. Let me know what your thoughts are. And then the code is bear market 20. And it's only good until Sunday, but that's that's pretty much it. But if you guys have any questions, please let me know. I want to just talk about Kineta's, um comment. She said that she or he converted um, their 401k to the Roth because it's a in the tax account and told you to spend the contribution. So it just it like, and that's perfect. And I'm so glad you said, and my tax accountant said, so that's perfect because again, I want everybody to run the numbers and like we can conceptually talk about how these accounts work, you know, who would probably be best served by moving money this way or that way, but always run the numbers because sometimes, and I've had this happen to me, I'll think one thing, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go do X, Y, Z. And I'm like, run those numbers. I was like, no, I'm not. I'm not going to do that because I ran the numbers and numbers told me it didn't make sense. So like I said, I would really, does anybody else have any questions or comments? I definitely put the link to the IB investor classes and the teachable. Um, and I also gave you guys the bear market 20 code. So let me know if you guys have questions. I'm really here to answer whatever you have going on because it's, it's a lot. It's a lot to talk about and it's really hard. So anything else that anyone has any questions about? Okay. All right. Oh, wait, someone does have a question. Let's pull it up. Um, let's see. So Chandra asked if it's wrong to switch and do a backdoor Roth. So it's, it's not necessarily wrong to switch to do a backdoor Roth, but I think it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it has to make sense for your financials picture. Because remember when you do a backdoor Roth, let me back up. Let's talk about what a backdoor Roth is. So a backdoor Roth is when you contribute money to a traditional IRA. And then at some point in the future, you switch it over to a Roth IRA. You usually do a backdoor IRA. Um, let me back up. So you Roths have a contribution. They have a annual adjusted gross income limit. So if you make, I think, as a single person, about one hundred seven hundred and thirty-seven thousand dollars, you cannot contribute to a Roth IRA. 
Um, if you're married, I think it's 200,000 that you can't contribute to a Roth IRA, like your combined income. So I, I do share that with people. So again, so it normally people will do a backdoor Roth IRA if they make over those thresholds of 200,000 if they're married or 137,000 um, if they are if they are single. Now, granted, but I think between 130 and 137,000, it kind of even phases out how much you can contribute to the Roth. So those are the things that happen when you kind of start making, you know, um, over six figures. But that being said, if you contribute to a, a traditional IRA and then convert it, then you get the benefit of having the Roth. But again, it depends on how long the account's been open that you do this conversion because any growth, it, the whole entire account will be taxed. And any growth that it's had in that account, it will also be taxed. So it's, it's kind of all those things that you have to really walk through the numbers and see if it makes sense for you. Um, so I think that was one question. I think I see one more question. So um, really good question. So there's a question that says that um, they're new to investing and they have a watch list on Robinhood, but they haven't purchased anything. And the bear market makes them want to jump in, which is great. And they were asking, you know, uh, I did say to wait because uh, this is kind of like the start of the slide to probably lower prices. So yeah, so I, I definitely, <laughs> yeah. So that's a really good question. And, and I think, you can start looking and if you want to buy, you're more than welcome to buy. I just try to put in perspective to people, for people to say, hey, you know, this is kind of, if we just started entering a bear market, this is probably not our bottom. Now, granted, I don't want you bottom chasing because nobody really knows where the bottom is. Like I couldn't have told you when, um, when I was working um, in 2009, because I was laid off in March of 09, I couldn't have told you that was the bottom of the market. I couldn't even told you. So, and I'm not saying that, you know, no one has a crystal ball, but I want people to kind of be just mindful and then saying, hey, am I comfortable with paying this amount of money for this particular stock? Um, and that's kind of where I want you to do. So if you want to buy now, then that's fine. But I think there's an opportunity in some cases, not all, for, the, for those prices to go down. But again, if you feel comfortable buying now, then go ahead. You know, and then you may want, say you have $1,000 to spend. You may want to say, you know what, I'll put $500 in and then I'll wait. I'll use my $500 later for another opportunity. You can do that. Maybe do $250 or however. But I want you guys to, like, the one of the things I've noticed that people get very fearful and they're like, oh, I'm so afraid I'm gonna make a mistake. You're gonna make mistakes. I made mistakes. I've been investing since 2004. I made plenty of mistakes. You're gonna make them. You know, just take your time and be patient with yourself. So if you wanna put in maybe 200, 250 out of whatever you have, that's great. Get started. And then you say, you know what? I feel comfortable. I'm really excited. So you can do it that way. Um, so let's see. So I'm just looking at a couple of different questions in here. So um, is it, the question is, is it okay to purchase long-term dividend paying stocks that they're um, in the bear market? And let's see. Oops. So uh, I'm just trying to read it. Um, so let's see, um, they switched their account from a 401k, which is a pre-tax account to a Roth IRA, which is um, possibly why she would owe taxes and receive and not receive taxes, even being a new homeowner with three child tax credits. It depends. It really depends on um, the numbers, on your personal financial situation. You, I mean, I, I don't know. I can't really tell you. I mean, there's certain things that would do an offset, but it depends on how much money you convert it from a 401k to a, a traditional, um, excuse me, from a traditional 401k to a Roth IRA. How much money did you do that? And remember, the taxes completely is going to be at your ordinary income rate. And if you didn't pay enough taxes, even with your credits, you're going to have to owe. But I don't know what your full tax situation is. So in those cases, I always tell people to meet with your accountant. And I tell people to meet with your accountant before you actually make the conversion because you cannot unring the bell. And that was actually a new rule under the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. Like once you do a conversion, you can't convert it back. So I always tell people kind of, you know, measure twice, cut once do it, you know, find out what you need to do, have a conversation, have a couple conversations with your tax accountant, run the numbers before you actually do the conversion. So um, let's see. Oh, I think it's awesome if you're, you contribute monthly and you're an investment club. Um, now, I do know that options are kind of scary. I will say they're very intimidating. Um, I always tell people you may want to do a covered call strategy, you know, do some covered um, as opposed to naked options because they, they are a lot safer 
and they're they're fun, but you have to kind of just jump in and um, trust yourself and, and don't spend a whole bunch of money, you know, and you're saying, okay, I won, I got some money off of it, great. If not, then, then you didn't lose a lot, but you're starting to learn. And you may also want to do the sink or swim um, simulator to kind of start you understanding how it works as opposed to like kind of putting your real money up. So um, let's see, Miss Washington, Leticia Washington said that she's um, in the beginning phases of investing. She's still learning about limits that set a duration. Um, let's see. Um, buying two to three stocks at a time. Is that a, a strategy for um, beginners in a bear market? Well, it depends. Everything depends. Um, I tell people all the time is that you have to feel comfortable with whatever strategy you have. So if you feel comfortable in that you're mastering your strategy, then you're great. Um, if not, then we have some, you know, you may want to try to change the way you're going about it. So I would definitely kind of take your time um, and then with your limits. Now, are you talking specifically about limits in terms of options or your, um, are you talking about going long? Cause that, cause that also depends on like kind of what my advice is for you and how you kind of move forward and kind of start working through. So let me clarify that for me and then we'll kind of come back. So let's see. Um, Chandra, I was looking at Chandra's comment. She said the options are scary. And then she took um, classes and she did a simulator and it just made her dizzy. I agree. When you kind of learn options, you don't learn with all of that stuff. And you're like, what are you saying? And it says like, blah, blah. It says, da, 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 call XYZ price. And then it gives you a number. It doesn't even tell you it's a price. It's like, gives you a number. And then it says something else. And you're just like, what? what are you saying to me? <laughs> so you're like, even if you understand the strategy, you can't quite do it like you would like to because like the whole options, you know, chain doesn't make sense. So I get it. So I definitely understand. So the simula simulator is on um, sink or swim. It's um, a TD, TD Ameritrade. They, it's their simulator. So I'm just trying to make sure I have everybody else's. Um, let's see. I think we have everybody else. Any other questions? Any other questions before we log off? I hope everybody got some value. Um, I will send this up. Um, I will send this up for everyone. Um, it, it has been recorded, so it will go up. I will send the link out. So if you have any other questions, you can more, you're more than welcome to um, reach out to me. The teachable sale is until Sunday, March 15th. And you get the Stocks 101 and the Understanding Bear Market Strategies for $67. Um, it expires on Sunday at 11.59 p.m. And uh, that link will go out with the, um, the coupon code. So if anybody else, wait, there's more questions. Um, okay. So if anyone else doesn't have any questions, thank you so much for joining. Um, I've had a great time and I hope you really did get some value from it. Like I said, you will get the replay so you can kind of watch it again just to see if you, um, if, if you want to replay something or if you missed something. So have a great one.